Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. You probably know by now that we study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series is a very, very interesting one, a challenging one, a very thought-provoking one on the Book of Romans. It's entitled Salvation by Faith Alone, the Book of Romans. And this is the third lesson in that series entitled The Human Condition. It's the lesson for October 21 of 2017. I hope you have your Bible handy. I hope you've read the book of Romans recently and that you're familiar with the ideas there. Let's jump in and see what we can learn. But before we begin, we ask you to join us in a word of prayer. Our kind and loving Father, as we read here, as clearly as it's presented anywhere, a description of the plan of salvation, help us to comprehend it, to understand it, as it applies to our lives and then to turn and use it in our daily living so that we may draw nearer to you as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, Paul starts out the book of Romans by greeting his friends in Rome. We've talked about that already. But then very quickly he moves into uh, the, his real question and that's the sinfulness of man. He starts with uh, that in, in um, verse 18, well, verse 16 and 17 of Romans 1, and it carries on through, actually through Romans 3. So that's going to be our main focus for today. There are two types of sinners described uh, and discussed in, in these chapters. The Gentiles or pagans, these would be the formerly Gentiles or, or, or pagans, have done almost everything they can to exclude God from their thinking. Their results are presented in Romans 1, 18, 32, an almost unspeakable, seemingly the worst list of sins in the entire Bible. The second group of sinners are the former Jews, who are described as those who claim to be righteous and as a result condemn the first group, which they see as terrible sinners. Because of the judgmental attitude of the former Jews and other kinds of problems as well, we should add, as described in Romans 2, God regards them as being even more sinful than the Gentiles or pagans. Now, that's a pretty scary thought. Because, I mean, let's be honest, are we more like chapter 1 or are we more like chapter 2? We don't have, all have to uh, confess our <laughs> sins at the same time. <laughs> But it certainly makes you think. Yeah. Well, we know that right through Scripture, the, the human condition has been described as sinful. Genesis 6, 5 to 7, he's talking about what led to the flood. 1 Kings 8, 46, and Solomon's prayer dedicating his temple, and then just on and on and on and on. And Ellen White goes on, well, actually, before that, let's turn. Here's a comment by Martin Luther, which we're focusing on, because remember, this is the 500th anniversary of his nailing those 95 theses to the wall, at, uh, to the church door at Wittenberg. The expression, all are under sin, must be taken in a spiritual sense. That is to say, not as men appear in their own eyes or in those of others, but as they stand before God. They are all under sin, those who are manifest transgressors in the eyes of men, as well as those who appear righteous in their own sights and before others. Those who perform outwardly good works do them from fear of punishment or love of gain and glory, otherwise or otherwise from pleasure in a certain object, now, but not from a willing and ready mind. I know those of you who've talked about the different levels of thinking people talk about, we start out by its fear of punishment or hope of reward. Here he's talking about that right here. Um, in this way, man excuses himself continually in good, exercises, I'm sorry, himself continually in good works outwardly, but inwardly he is totally immersed in sinful desires, evil lusts, which are opposed to good works. Martin Luther, Commentary on Romans, page 69. Now, I don't know if that was intended to be a commentary on Luther's own condition or not, but uh, Ellen White goes on to say something similar. 
Let no one take the limited, narrow position that any of the works of man can help in the least possible way to liquidate the debt of his transgression. This is a fatal deception. Now, if you plan to earn your way to heaven, that's a pretty scary thought. If you would understand it, you must cease haggling over your pet ideas and with humble hearts survey the atonement. And of course, the atonement, she's talking about the death of Christ, the life and death. This matter is so dimly comprehended that thousands upon thousands claiming to be sons of God are children of the wicked one because they will depend on their own works. God always demanded good works, the law demands it, but because man placed himself in sin where his good works were valueless, Jesus' righteousness alone can avail. Christ is able to save to the uttermost because he ever liveth to make intercession, intercession for us. And you know she's quoting Romans 8, verse 34. So, has God left us in a hopeless condition? No. No. I'm happy to hear that. Well, after 15 verses of introduction in Romans 1, Paul went immediately to his main subject, the gospel. Now, if I asked us to define the gospel, we would probably have several significantly different versions of the gospel, although we spent enough time talking together, we might come up with something similar. But here's what Paul said, Romans 1, 16 and 17. I'm going to read first from the Revised Standard Version. For I am not ashamed of the gospel. It is a power of God for salvation to everyone who has faith, to the Jews first and also to the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed through faith for faith. Now, the big question is, why would the righteousness of God need to be revealed? As it is written, he who through faith is righteous shall live. Okay? So, are we like Paul, proud of the gospel? Or are we like Jonah, embarrassed by it? Remember what Jonah said? He said, you know, let me die. You know, here I am, I came all this way to condemn these sinners here in the, in the city of Nineveh, and God, when, you, when they repented, you let them live. And I'm, I'm so angry I could die. Well, we need to be honest here. Few verses have resulted in more variations of opinion and translation than have Romans 1, 16 and 17. Three key words are very important in our understanding of this passage. So let's nail those down first as far as possible. Gospel. The word gospel is a translation of the Greek word euangelion, which means just plain and simply good news. And that's, of course, why I use very often the, the Good News Bible. Um, and that, that's, of course, where that term comes from. If something is not good news, it cannot be described as gospel. We are all inherently hopelessly sinners, so the good news cannot be primarily about us. That should be a warning to start out with. Another word, righteousness. Since man is described as wholly sinful, he has no righteousness of his own. Thus, we are left with two other possibilities, and here's where things go crazy. A, this righteousness is a righteousness from God, which is legally transferred to our account through a process called justification. This is the view of Martin Luther. And remember that Martin Luther's attitude was, and remember that he got this from the Roman Catholic Church, his attitude was, we must deal with our past sins. If we don't deal with every single past sin and keep clearing up our past records, we're going to be lost. Very simply, we're going to be lost. Um, but the other possibility about that uh, righteousness of God is that it's really God's own righteousness, and that is the clear and that is the clear meaning of this of the simple reading of Romans 1, 16 and seventeen. But who would dare to question God's righteousness? That shouldn't be a problem for Seventh-day Adventists who know about the Great Controversy. The, the whole Great Controversy started before this world was created when Satan challenged God's righteousness right in heaven. But Martin Luther didn't understand any of that. So, and the third word is faith in those words. 
in those, those two verses. The Greek word pistis is, a, is variously translated in the New Testament as faith, belief, confidence, or trust. All those are th words translated from the same Greek word. So what does God need to do to restore a trusting relationship with his children? Can God be trusted? How can we be sure? Taste and see that the Lord is good. Taste and see that the Lord is good. How do we do that? By spending time with him. Mm -hmm. In prayer and Bible study, uh, sharing, listening to other, the testimony of others. Mm -hmm. Why do you think so few of God's children down through the centuries have had any idea about the great controversy over God's character and government? Well, the adversary's not asleep. He's busy. Well, was there anybody that did before 1844? Well, that's a fair question. Uh, I think Paul did. I think Paul did? Mm -hmm. Well, John Milton in his Paradise Lost in some, some ways. Ellen yeah. White of stealing it from Milton and stuff. Yeah. But, uh, I mean, the truth is out there and God uh, tries to give to anyone who's truly seeking the truth as much as they can, but we, we understand it in different ways. So, We we'll go back to uh, Romans uh, one sixteen, For the power of God for salvation, mm -hmm. if we define that word as healing, healing yeah. then uh, it, it tends to expand our understanding and, and makes more sense. If, if we look at sin as a disease, and diseases generally don't need forgiveness, they need healing. And the healing needs to go on in your brain, in your mind, and mm. that takes time. And so God has, uses teaching methods, various teaching, teaching methods to uh, persuade, which is another definition of the word uh, faith, that, that faith is a persuasion. Mm. God uses words. First, uh, give me John 1.1. 1, 1 in the beginning was the word and so forth. So he, God logically uses words to communicate the truth about himself. Mm -hmm. And if we have truth, we have an affinity or an appreciation for truth, we can uh, have, do have some healing going on up in our brain. And you mentioned that uh, salvation means healing. In fact, that's from the original Greek word. It right. means healing. It also means salvation. The same, and we recognize that in words in, that come into English. Salve, S-A-L-V-E, is a healing something that you put on your skin. It's the same. It comes from the same word, uh, from uh, sozo in, in Greek, which means salvation. Ellen White uses it, an expression, vital connection, mm -hmm. and I tend to see the healing more in terms of that connection that was mm -hmm. severed when we fell. Uh, I'm not saying there aren't things that need to heal within our, uh, our self, yeah. but, but well, it's not just, I don't think it's just about healing our thinking process, uh, except if you think about it in terms of our connection to God. Yeah. Well, and as a man thinketh, so is he, right? So it's, uh, that's what yeah, we... Yeah, but... It continues we, growing. Yeah, but it's not self-contained. It's no. There's no. always has to be this vital connection with God, and that's what was uh, severed, and that's what needs to be restored in order for mm -hmm. us to be saved. That's And the severing was on our part, right? Right. We, we moved away. It wasn't God right. uh, saying, oh, I'll turn their back. No, you're bent on going. I'll e God will eventually honor your choice if that's what you choose to do. Well, Martin Luther in his commentary on Romans, page 41, said these words, and it puzzles me to think that someone could, could say this, but this righteousness, however, is not that according to which God himself is righteous as God according to Luther, but that by which we are justified by him through faith and the gospel. It is called the righteousness of God in contradistinction to man's righteousness, which comes from works. Does that sound very persuasive to you? No, I think it's, it all is all about uh, Jesus <clears throat> said, uh, why do you call me, or asked, why do you call me good? Only God is good. So if there's going to be any goodness 
or righteousness, uh, then it needs to come from God and it, His character. Yeah. Well, why do some of us think that it, God's righteousness needs to be revealed, that we should read that just the way it reads? Well, you put that with uh, Romans 3.25 sure. and 26. That's exactly what it says. Unfortunately, the, the translators, the majority of the translations, have muddied it up with some legal terms which are not in the text. Yeah. And it wasn't that Paul didn't know what, that he needed some help uh, uh, and, 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 the, and that Tyndale didn't need that help. And even, even Martin Luther in Romans 3.25 it, 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 Jesus was a, a, a place of mercy or a seat of mercy, yeah. not in stool. And, and Tyndale comes across, along with a, a seat of mercy, I think is what, mm -hmm. he, what he said. So, uh, it's so it's relatively simple. But theologians, maybe they have a... a, a well, the, if you don't understand the great controversy, you can't understand why God's righteousness needs to be revealed. Right. Well, and, and Paul in Second Corinthians three, you know, we'll be coming yeah. back to this. Uh, we, with all, you know, with all, we all with unveiled face, beholden as a mirror, and the glory of the Lord are being transformed from the same image, from glory to glory, just as the Lord, the Spirit. And then further down, it says we see the light of the glory of God in the face of Jesus. So uh, that's all talking about His character and the revelation of it. Yeah. So we need to keep focused on the fact that sin did not begin here on planet Earth. It started in heaven, right around the throne of God. And this Earth was created to answer the questions for, in the minds of the two-thirds of the heavenly intelligences that did not buy Satan's mm -hmm. uh, lies. But isn't the re revelation of God an ongoing thing? Mm -hmm. Sure. I, I believe it is. Yeah, yeah. It's an so, it, so doesn't isn't that true that the 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 Lord has to be revealed? It's, I believe it's true. Yeah. Yeah. and Spirit. We, the, the he used you know, what used the the word atonement, but really that word is a made up word by Tyndale. My understanding is, which means at one mint, a state of harmony, mm -hmm. which is, I believe God when He first chose to create. Everything God has done since that time and will do on into eternity is to do what he can to make his creation, his intelligent creatures, uh, be in harmony. And instead of uh, have fraction, uh, having factions and so on and so forth, everything is harmony. It's not an event 2,000 years ago. Hmm. Uh, it's, as some theolo so-called theologians have said, it's ongoing, yeah. like Gary uh, mentioned. Well. If we understand what happened with Adam and Eve, that they were separated from God, separated from the source of life, separated from the tree of life, then what needs to happen for us to restore, to be restored? That um, connection that, yeah. that was lost, severed and lost so that we can behold the light of the glory yeah, exactly. of God. Exactly. And as we've already suggested, the separation began not here on this earth, but up in heaven. When, when Satan and his, his crew rebelled. And that's, of course, Revelation 12, 7 to 12. Um, well, we go through John 14, 15, 16, 17. Yeah. John 14, you've seen me, you've seen the Father. The, the disciples wanted to know about the Father. John 15, everything I learned from my Father, I've taught you. John 16, 25, 26. Uh, everything, excuse me, I don't need to pray to the Father for you because the Father himself loves you. And then you get to John 17, 3 and 4. I've accomplished the work you gave me to do. I have made known your character. Yeah. Uh, and, and he hasn't even gone out to die yet. Yet the, the, the work has been accomplished. And of course, Paul, in, was it Romans 5, 10? We are reconciled, I think it goes in general translation, by his death, but we are healed and that the healing is our, the way we think about God. Because it, if it's a law of human nature that you become like the person or thing that you worship or admire, mm -hmm. yeah. then it's, 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 the logic is there. And Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28 describe Satan's selfish attempts to rise up at least equal with God, or maybe even he would have loved to be above God. 
Um, well, and of course, said that, that he was the first evolutionist. You know, <laughs> he just thought God got there first and built a barrier to keep everybody from uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> reaching him. Well, um, war broke out in heaven, as you know, and Satan and those who chose to join with him were cast down to this earth. Thus, sin began when Satan accused God of not being fair or be, of being untrustworthy and of selfishly not being willing to share his powers. God has always taken the loving, unselfish approach toward his children. He has been willing to share as much as possible what he can with, with us. Satan is absolutely, it turns him green that he can't reproduce like we can. But think what would happen if he had the power to reproduce. He would fill the universe full of little Satans. Right? He'd probably kill off a, f a fair amount of them too, just because yeah. he's so perverse. <laughs> mm. So the great controversy began in, with the first sin when questions and accusations were made against God and the way he runs his universe. Remember right there in Genesis, God says, sin leads to death. And what was the first thing out of the Satan's mouth that we have in the Bible? That's a lie. Well, down through the century, Satan has added to his accusations against God. He first told Adam and Eve that God lied to them about death being the result of sin. That's uh, Genesis 3, 1 to 5. He wanted Adam and Eve to join him in making accusations against God. Over time, Satan has accused God of being arbitrary, exacting, vengeful, unforgiving, and severe. Remember, he has accused God of running this ever-burning ever hell. He's accused God of being a tyrant, all sorts of things. Satan has claimed that God is just waiting to destroy his children if they have committed even one unconfessed sin. He has claimed that God is responsible for an ever-burning hell. In actual fact, these accusations are descriptive of Satan himself, not God, but he accuses God of being like that. If God were in fact like that, would you want to live with him forever? So then when God, when the Satan accuses uh, to God in the, in the onlooking universe, what he's doing is uh, demonstrating his own character. Looking in a mirror. Yeah. Well, he says, God says, he says, God is not fair. Look at what these people are doing. And Jesus says, it, it, it doesn't matter what they've done, it's what they're doing, going to do now. Yeah. It's called projection. Yeah. 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 So we have the choice. Are we going to believe God or are we going to believe Satan? And what evidence can we provide? for making a choice one way or the other. So what did Paul think was the essence of the gospel? So he, he starts out with this, I am so thankful for this good news, I want to describe it to you, and what's the first thing he talks about? The God's wrath. wrath. Now if you, if you think that salvation is all about how he saves you and me, why would you start talking out start be, begin by talking about God's wrath look at look at the passage itself Romans 1:18 God's anger wrath is revealed from heaven against all the sin and evil of the people whose evil ways prevent the truth from being known so what's the problem with this what's God most concerned about let me put it that way truth about himself and the way he his character is yeah prevent the truth from being known so if the essence of the gospel is how God saves you and me why did Paul turn immediately discussing God's wrath is God's wrath the first thing you think of when someone mentions the gospel or the good news if someone said to you what is the gospel do you start off immediately talking about God's wrath <laughs> Some people might. Yeah. what some people might. Some people might. And brimstone. I've heard several uh, TV programs where they talk about they get up to Romans 1, uh, 1 16 and 18, and then they go off in some tangent. They don't finish the chapter. Yeah. The chapter is hey, God will honor your choice. Yeah. <laughs> he will, you'll move yourself out of God's sphere of protection. If the gospel is primarily about how God saves you and me, then God's wrath is primarily about how, I'm sorry, then God's wrath is somewhat, a somewhat peripheral issue. However, if the gospel is about the righteousness of God and whether or not God can be trusted, 
then the truth about God's wrath is actually core to our understanding. Does he get angry? Does he t turn to a vengeful tyrant? If, if that's what happens under certain circumstances, you don't want to trust him. And what sin is it that stirs up God's wrath right up front that Paul mentions? Suppression of the truth. Suppression or twisting the truth about God and thus preventing it from being known. And yet they're without excuse, it says. How often do we misrepresent God to our children? How often do we misrepresent God to our associates at work? Don't want to think about it. <laughs> want to move on to the new stuff. Okay. To, uh, to representing him. Yeah. You know, confession so, and repentance and yeah. go on to. Our Bible study guide focuses in this lesson on the sinfulness of human beings. It skips over this description of God's wrath completely. However, this is one of the most important points found in Romans 1. So what is God's wrath? What does God do to his enemies? If Satan is correct in his accusations against God, then God's wrath would be revealed by his torturing his enemies in everlasting flames, as many, many, many people believe. And by parroting that idea, they are basically following, uh, they're, they're parroting Satan. Yeah, that's true. And then and instead of understanding that sin pays its wage, not yeah. God. God doesn't yeah. it has to do anything to anybody. He just and, and, and I would like to ask choice. this question. I believe that Lucifer, back in the beginning, while he was still in heaven, was an intelligent being. If he really thought God was like that, would he have dared to rebel? If he really thought that God was, he, I was, he was going to end up being thrown into some eternally burning hell, would you dare to rebel? So what does God's wrath, what does Romans 1 tell us about God's wrath? Well, let me read some verses. And so God has given these people, those people over to do the thing, filthy things their hearts desire, and they do shameful things with each other. They exchange the truth about God for a lie. They worship and serve what God has created instead of the Creator Himself, who is to be praised forever. Amen. By the way, uh, they exchange the truth about God for a lie. That's substitution. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because they do this, God has given them over. Notice tw verse 24, God has given them over. Verse 26, God has given them over. The Greek word is paradidomi. It's a very key word in our understanding of the plan of salvation. But these people now are given over to shameful passions. Even the women pervert the natural use of their sex sorry, um, by unnatural acts. In the same way the men give up natural sexual relations with women and burn with passion for each other. Men do shameful things with each other as a result they bring upon themselves as punishment they deserve for the wrongdoing. And then 28, because those people refuse to keep in mind the true knowledge about God, remember up, on, up in verse 18 it talks about twisting and perverting the truth, because they refuse to keep in mind the truth about true knowledge about God, he has given them over to corrupted minds so that they do the things that they should not do. Romans 1.18 should not be read alone. It has to be the whole rest of the chapter. Otherwise, they're mi misleading. Yeah. It's deception. This whole idea about Romans 1 uh, is not new. This whole idea about God's wrath in Romans 1. It's all through the Old Testament. Go back and read Judges 2 and 3, and especially Hosea 11. Paul showed that he understood this clearly by quoting, talking about God's wrath in chapter 3, he quotes six passages straight out of the Old Testament. So what is it that God wants from us? Do we know? Listen, take instruction. Romans 2.4 says that God has shown his goodness and kindness to lead us to repentance. That is, to change our minds about him. So, we need to see the truth first, and then as we see the truth and begin to comprehend it, our attitudes toward God need to change. He does not want to have to, have to hand us over to consequences of our own sins. How does God feel about handing over his children to reap the consequences of their own sins? 
Let me pick just a couple of verses out of Romans 11. I'm sorry, he, <laughs> he, uh, Hosea 11. I'm going to pick out verses 7 and 8. This is talking about wicked people back in, in Hosea's day. They insist on turning away from me. They will cry out because of the yoke that is on them, but no one will lift it from them. But how can I give you up, Israel? How can I abandon you? Could I ever destroy you as I did Adba or treat you as I did Zoboim? My heart will not let me do it. My love for you is too strong. These are God's words to the nation of Israel, the northern kingdom of Israel, just before he had to finally hand them over to the Assyrians. Well, you got uh, also in Hosea uh, 4, yeah. 17, Ephraim is joined to idols, let him alone. Yeah. I mean, they have what? given themselves to, into a harlotly, the shame more than so on and so forth. Yeah, all through the Old Testament, God says, I'll, but I will all heal you, I'll restore you. But the complaint is you're not listening. Mm -hmm. So God weeps over the wicked as he has to let them go and perish. After pointing out the terrible sinfulness of the Gentile pagans and others, also the terrible sinfulness of the judgmental Jews, Paul proceeds to Romans 3, and here's where we hit the, the real crux of things. Let me look at a couple passages, a couple different ways of looking at Romans 3 here. Have the Jews then any advantage over the Gentiles? Or is there any value in being circumcised? Much indeed, in every way. In the first place, God trusted his message to the Jews. So what advantage did they have? They were the ones who were given the word of God, right? But what if some of them were not faithful? Does this mean that God will not be faithful? Certainly not. God must be true even though every human being is a liar. As the scripture says, you must be shown to be right when you speak. You must win your case when you are being tried. Huh? God being tried? In what way? We don't want to read that from uh, the NIV. Yeah. <laughs> Which makes the well, most of it. In a sense, he's on trial in how he handles the judgment. How is he going to be just and the justifier of those who put their trust in him? Now, it's kind of a strange idea for us to, to, to judge judges. But what do we do when, when someone says, I want to appoint a new person to be a Supreme Court judge? What do we do? We evaluate them. We, we look at what their judgments have been in the past. And God says... If you're going to come to trust me, you need to look at what, what I've done in the past. Look at everything you can get your hands on about what I've done in the past and see if those judgments are fair. Can you trust me? That's what we need to know. But if, God, if the gospel is only about how God saves you and me, the, these verses are puzzling. People don't know what to do with them. And uh, read, as Jim suggested, read some of the other translations, several different translations on Romans uh, 3, 1 to 4, and you'll see that they've, uh, there's all sorts of crazy notions. However, if, as we have suggested, sin began in the courts of heaven with accusations against God and questions about his trustworthiness, then there's every reason in the world to say that God must win his case in court the opinions of the entire universe. But how many Christians are concerned about God's reputation? We have become so egocentric and selfish that all we can think of, even when we talk about the gospel, the only thing we, we can think about is, how is God going to save me? Uh, and, and you too, of course. But mostly me, you understand. Yeah, people put out bumper stickers, God loves you, but I'm his favorite. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or, <laughs> or Christians aren't perfect, just forgiven. Yeah. Which is really, you know, which is. Well, so many th that the new translations have put in where it really means uh, uh, healed, or, or uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, anyway, they generally put in the word forgiven. Mm -hmm. Forgiveness is not the issue. No. Because a, a, a guy with lung cancer, he needs healing, right? You say, well, I forgive you. Well, that's still, is that going to solve my, 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 my medical problem, my, my, my disease? Well, sin, if sin is a disease, you need far more than, than uh, forgiveness. Mm -hmm. 
Well, those who take the larger, broader, deeper, wider approach to understanding the great controversy between God and Satan over the character and government of God, that's what it's about. Satan said, I can run a better universe than God. Okay? Let's, let's find out. Okay? They recognize that if God cannot be trusted, then salvation would be meaningless. So the first issue that must be resolved is whether or not God can be trusted. Let us make no mistake here. We are all sinners and desperately in need of God's healing salvation. Okay? Um, I don't know if we need to read these verses. Let me read just a few of them. Starting Romans 3, after, after making those words a little bit we just read. Well then, are we Jews in any better condition than the Gentiles? This is verse 9. Romans 3, verse 9. Not at all. I've already shown that Jews and Gentiles alike are all under the power of sin. As the scriptures say, there is no one. Uh, so, hold on. As the scriptures say, there is no one who is righteous, no one who is wise, or who worships God. All have turned away from God. They have all gone wrong. No one does right, not even one. So that's pretty clear, right? And those passages, by the way, are taken from the Septuagint, which is a little different. Uh, that's the Greek translation. It's a little different than the, than the Hebrew that most of our modern translations are taken from, but basically the same idea. Well, let's ask you out there. Have you taken a good look at yourself recently? Is there anything in your life about which you could boast before Jesus and the Father? Well, look at these verses. What do you think about this? Is This gives us a clue. Jeremiah 9, 23 and 24. The Lord says, The wise should not boast of their wisdom, nor the strong of their strength, nor the rich of their wealth. If anyone wants to boast, he should boast that he knows and understands me because my love is constant. And I do what is just and right. These are the things that please me. Okay, so if you want something to boast about, that boast you know about God. God. Yeah, that you know God. The good news is always about God. And that's eternal life. Mm-hmm to know the Father and Jesus Christ who he sent is, to, is eternal life. Early in the 20th century, it was commonly thought that man was improving and that it was just a matter of time until we would be living in a perfect world. Well, the 20th century turned out to be the most violent and wicked century in history. Do Paul's comments on Romans 1, 18 to 32 apply to our world today? Mm -hmm. Pretty much, huh? I can tell you that I went with a group of people just recently to travel through Eastern Europe, and one of the places we visit was Auschwitz. Now, most of you probably heard, the, heard that word used a few times. That's the place where the Nazis thought they were, gonna, they were gonna produce the final solution for the Jewish problem. And they sent by train loads of Jews there from all over Europe and murdered they first gassed and then cremated 1.1 million Jews. They were burning bodies just as fast as they could. It, 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 just, it just blows my mind to, to think of what happened there. We, not, we may not be as evil as, as we believe those pagans described in Romans 1 used to be, but how about his comments about the former Jewish believers recorded in Romans 2, 1 to 3? Let's look at those verses. Could those possibly apply to us? Look at, look at Romans 2, 1 to 3. Do you, my friend, pass judgment on others? You have no excuse at all, whoever you are. For when you judge others and then do the same things which they do, you condemn yourself. We know that God is right when he judges the people who do such things as these. But you, my friends, do those very things for which you pass judgment on others. Do you think you will escape God's judgment? And then dropping down to uh, verses 17 to 24. What about you? You call yourself a Jew. You depend on the law and boast about God. You know what God wants you to do. And you have, to le you have learned from the law to choose what is right. You are sure that you are a guide to, for the blind, a light for those who are in darkness. Don't we claim that we have the light? Are we, are we, aren't we the light of the world? Okay. An instructor to the foolish, a teacher for the ignorant. 
You are certain that in the law you have the full content of knowledge and of truth. Don't we say we have the truth? We teach others. You teach others, why don't you teach yourself? You preach, do not steal, but do your, you yourself steal? You say, do not commit adultery, but do you commit adultery? You detest idols, but, you, but do you rob temples? You boast about having God's law, but do you bring shame on God by breaking his law? The scripture says, because of you Jews, the Gentiles speak evil of God. Wow. Jesus himself said something similar in Matthew 7, 3 to 5, and Luke 6, 41 and 42. Might those words apply to us as Seventh-day Adventists? Are we at all judgmental? Do we think that we might be better than some other people out there in the world? We should examine ourselves to see if we're in the faith. Yeah. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 13, 5, I think. Martin Luther comments like this. After the apostle has shown that all heathen are sinners, he now in a special and most emphatic way shows that also the Jews live in sin. Above all, because they obey the law only outwardly, that is, according to the letter and not according to the spirit. And of course, he, the truth is, the verses go on to say, part of the problem is that they're so judgmental. Romans 2, 4 is a verse we need to pay more attention to. He goes on, Paul goes on to say, and perhaps you despise his great kindness, tolerance, and patience. Surely you know that God is kind because he's trying to lead you to repent. Now, if you have a very perverted idea about God and you think he's just waiting to destroy sinners, are you focusing on God's kindness? That would make you run away or turn, at least try to get away. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Well, God's kindness is supposed to lead us to repentance. How does that work? Well, the light in John 3, um, yeah, John th uh, 3, uh, mm -hmm. the light comes into the world and we either are drawn to the light or we hide ourselves from the light. Mm -hmm. Okay, Romans 2, verses 5 to 11 going on, goes on to show that good works should be the result of our salvation never the cause or source of our salvation. And we come now to these words from Ellen White. A terrible picture of the condition of the world has been presented before me. Immorality abounds everywhere. I hate to even think what you would say about our world today. Licentiousness is the special sin of this age. Never did vice lift its deformed head with such boldness as now. The people seem to be benumbed, and the lovers of virtue and true goodness are nearly discouraged by its, uh, by its boldness, strength, and prevalence. The iniquity which abounds is not merely confined to the unbeliever and the scoffer. Would that this were the case. But it is not. Many men and women who profess the religion of Christ are guilty. Even some who profess to be looking for his appearing are no more prepared for that event than Satan himself Wow. They are not cleansing themselves from all pollution. They have so long served their, lu that lu their lust that it is natural for their thoughts to be impure and their imaginations corrupt. It is as impossible to cause their minds to dwell upon pure and holy things as it would be to turn the course of Niagara and send its waters pouring up the falls. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 2, 346. What a statement. Wow. Plain enough. <laughs> Plain enough? <laughs> well, another issue in understanding the book of Romans is the use of long Latin terms for the various processes involved. What is the correct meaning of justification, sanctification, even salvation? And first, we should mention this. It's justification by what? Faith. Sa sanctification by what? Faith. Salvation by what? Faith. <laughs> so what's our part in all of that? Faith, right? If we have the faith, God will take care of the justification, the sanctification, the salvation. He does all of that. Justification was originally a Latin word derived or translated from the Greek word dikaiao. The basic meaning of dikaiao is 
to set right. However, modern theologians have twisted this because th th it doesn't seem to fit a lot of places. They have twisted this uh, and turned it rather into a statement to declare righteous or to legally right, even though no actual change has taken place in the person. Now let's think about that for a moment. Sanctification comes from a Greek word, hagiao, which means literally to make holy or to set apart for holy purposes. The whole process of how God saves human beings is summed up by the word salvation, which again is a Latin word which means to heal, as we mentioned earlier, or to save. The same word is used for both to heal and to save, or to save. It comes from the Greek word sozo, also meaning to heal or to save. To avoid these long words, I would suggest you turn to the Good News Bible, which I love. So once again, we see the dilemma showing up. What is necessary for God to save human beings? Is it a legal process whereby he corrects our legal records in heaven, perhaps even erasing the evidence against us? Now, I don't know how many of you grew up with this idea that as we live our lives every day, every deed, every, especially every sin, is written down there in heaven. And you better get on your knees at night and pray because what needs to happen? Confess. You confess your sins and then what happens? Peace. God takes a giant eraser, right? And he erases those, those sins. And you hope that you've, forgive, you've asked for forgiveness for every single sin so that your record's going to be clean. As if you had never done anything in all your life. So that one day God will say, well, I don't see any marks against him. He must be savable, right? Well, we just thank God for being uh, the way he is, and that is he's forgiving. Yeah. In fact, he tells the story of forgiveness uh, when the disciple says, well, how many times should we forgive? And they says seven times. No, 70 times. What he's 70 times said, what he's really saying is always be forgiving. And he's telling them, isn't God forgiving? The problem is not forgiveness. The problem is have we been healed, which uh, they, where they should use the word remission, they use the word forgive. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's a problem, a process of healing, which has to do with, uh, give me, uh, remission has to do with healing as opposed mm -hmm. to forgiveness. Well, is the process of salvation something that takes place in the books in heaven? We don't even, we have no awareness of what's going on there. We have, no change happens in us. It's up going on up there or does it change us in some way well it has to change us because that's that's what happened when we fell we we changed we mm -hmm. the connection with god was broken so in order to be restored or healed uh, however we want to apply that we need that vital connection with god again we must be born again mm -hmm. uh, it's not just uh, making over the way things are it's a whole new creation yeah. Well, you know that Martin Luther, since that's one of the things we're sort of focusing on on this series, came out of the Roman Catholic Church where they, they had this idea that you have to do a certain number of good works. If the number of good works outweighs the number of bad works in your life, then you'll be saved. If the bad works outweigh the good works, you're going to be lost. So basically, you're saved by doing good works. Judaism is not all that much different to no. the, the, the balance of scales and the mm -hmm. and, uh. but God says in order to be savable and taken to heaven you must be truly healed what does it take for us to be healed don't we need to understand the truth about God and his character if we understand that truth would it help us to take a different attitude toward him if trust could be restored between God and his children and if it was safe for him to trust us, and if we could learn to trust him once again, would that solve the sin problem? That's part of, it would restore the relationship. If a restored relationship is there, wouldn't that make it safe for God to and, and, and let us come into heaven? It's in harmony, that's at one, and that's, yeah. all, that's all God has really ever wanted. So now, let me ask you, to think of these questions. We have some questions about that. Is God primarily concerned about clearing up our records, about forgiving us? We've suggested that God, there's no problem with God for, in forgiving. 
or is it about healing and restoring us and making us safe to live in his kingdom and in his glorious presence? Yep. That's one question. Do we have any evidence that the life and death of Jesus was necessary not only to save and heal us, but also to answer questions even in the minds of the onlooking universe? Well, that's what Romans 3, 25 and 26 is all about. Yeah. Is to demonstrate that God is righteous. Three times we're, in those two. You're getting, getting ahead of getting, us. That's okay, the well, subject for next week's lesson. Well, it, it, we can say it every week about yeah. uh, twice per program, and it wouldn't be enough because right. it goes right past a lot of people. Well, but let's look at specifically the Bible talks about this. Look at 1 Corinthians 4 and 9. For it seems to me that God has given the very last place to us apostles, like people condemned to die in public, as a spectacle for the whole world of angels and of humanity. Now, do the angels need forgiveness? The good angels. But they, they don't need forgiveness, but they need to understand the character of God and okay. that God can be trusted. Okay. So, And they uh, apparently did trust God because they uh, stayed with him and Jesus said yeah. they, they continually behold the face of the Father who is in heaven. And that's the situation that God wants for us too to be able to behold him. But they still, the sinless angels still had questions because they had heard the lies. Yeah. And so they hung around until finally the cross when they, uh, when the dem the ultimate demonstration, Romans, uh, excuse me, uh, Colossians 1, 19 and 20, and Ephesians 1, 9 and 10, and first we're going to look at that here. All of that. Uh, yeah. it was, it, God is a teacher and he's not a penalty payer. Let me, let's just read those verses. <laughs> Ephesians 1, 7 to 10. For the blood of Christ, we, if by the blood of Christ we are set free, that is, our sins are forgiven. How great is the grace of God which he gave to us in such large measure. And all his wisdom and insight, God did what he had purposed and made known to us. Now what does this have to do with the blood of Christ? He made known to us the secret plan he had already decided to complete by means of Christ. This plan, which God will complete when the time is right, is to bring all creation together, everything in heaven and on earth, with Christ as head. So does God need to do, accomplish something up in heaven? Well, look at chapter 3, the last part of verse 9 and, and, and verse 10. God, who is the creator of all things, kept his secret hidden that's his mystery, through all the past ages, in order that at the present time, by means of the church, the angelic rulers and powers in the heavenly world might learn of his wisdom in all its different forms. What could they possibly learn from us about God? They're living with him in heaven. Well, you mentioned Colossians 1, 19 and 20. This is Colossians 1, 20. Through the Son, then, God decided to bring the whole universe back to himself. God made peace through his son's blood, his sacrificial death, on the cross, and so brought back to himself all things both on earth and in heaven. So there has to be a problem in heaven. There has to be something wrong with their understanding of God's character and his government for all that to be necessary. Well, if we've we got guardian angels, there's an awful lot of them down here. Yeah. So we, they, we, heaven, we don't want to confine it to some spot out there. No. It's, uh, it's but a I, I'm grand trying scheme. to say we can't leave them out. No, absolutely not. It, sh those texts he didn't, that's for sure. Well, the Spirit searches the depths of God, mm -hmm. it says in First Corinthians. So uh, a casual acquaintance is not, yeah. doesn't tell you everything about a person. So the, the more you get to know them, the more you know the depths of their, and you don't really know them unless you go through things with them and you yeah. observe what they do in this situation and that. So Good. all of this is unfolding before the universe. Yeah. We've got a couple more quotations to look at, so we're about running out of time. First Peter 1 Peter 1.12 says, God revealed to these prophets that their work was not for their own benefit, but for yours, as he's speaking to his friends in those days, as they spoke about those things which you have now heard from the messengers who announced the good news by the power of the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. These are things which even the angels would like to understand. Do the angels still need to learn something? Ellen White put it this way, but the plan of redemption had a yet broader and deeper purpose than the salvation of man. I we thought, got John 12, 32. I, if I be lifted up, I will draw 
all unto myself. It includes yeah. the heavenly intelligences, not just mankind. It was not for this alone that Christ came to the earth. It was not merely that the inhabitants of this little world might regard the law of God as it should be regarded, but it was to vindicate the character of God before the universe. Why would that be necessary? He'd be, because he'd been the accused. He had to He's be been accused. accused. Yeah, yeah exactly. Been accused him. To this result of his great sacrifice, its influence upon the intelligences of other worlds as well as upon man. So we are supposed to learn what the angels are also learning, right? The Savior looked forward when just before his crucifixion he said, Jim, here's your verse, now is the judgment of this world, now shall the prince of this world be cast out, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all unto me. Now many of you know that in the King James Version, the word men is added there, but you'll notice that it's in italics, and if you look carefully, you'll discover that words are, that are in italics in the King James are not there in the original. It was not there. The act of Christ in drawing, I'm sorry, the act of Christ in dying for the salvation of man would not only make heaven accessible to men, but before all the universe, it would justify God and his son in their dealing with the rebellion of Satan. It would establish the perpetuity of the law of God and would reveal the nature and res the result of sin. Patriarchs and Prophets 68 and 69. So in our study of Romans, we will attempt to look beyond our human dilemma to the broader, higher, deeper, universe-wide controversy that has involved all of the intelligent beings in God's universe. By doing this, we can read the book of Romans just as it was intended to be read in its simplest, straightforward meaning and avoid stretching and straining the translation to make it fit what we want it to say. It will be an exciting journey. We're going to ask you to join us each week as we work our way through the book of Romans. And we're going to find out that there's some incredible things buried a little below the surface, not for just superficial reading, but for plain reading, reading it clearly, reading it just the way it says, and thinking about what is the context here? Is this, can we, can we understand God's character? Can we learn more about his government? Can we come to really trust him? That's what really matters. Do we have solid evidences for that? Our kind and loving Father, as we bow before you once again, we thank you for these marvelous truths that we are, un we are discovering here in your book of, of Romans that you helped Paul to, to present to us. We, we, we sometimes like to think about what Paul was doing, what he was thinking as he sat down there in Corinth and, and wrote out this letter to the church at Rome that he was hoping to visit soon. We are so thankful that it has been preserved for us so that we can understand more about your character, about your forgiveness, about how you have set up this wonderful plan of salvation. May we each one claim to be a part of it is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.